Castleberry, and this is another one of my philosophical lecture shorts. Uh, today we're going to be talking about logic. And before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that this is, you know, a uh, lecture is kind of designed for my 101 class and our, our short section on logic. So I won't be doing a full kind of in-depth thing on logic, um, just kind of the, uh, the parts that we need for our class. But hopefully, if you are if you're coming here and you're, you know, trying to get a you know, brief idea of what logic is and why it's important, I think we'll be able to help you out. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is the, the definition of logic. It's the standards of good argument, which is very important in philosophy, uh, especially consider when we talk about uh, the other branches of philosophy, like metaphysics, ethics, um, epistemology, or aesthetics, that if we're going to be arguing there and determining what the truth of those things are, if we don't have a good model of what should be a good argument, we can never decide those things. So logic, a lot of philosophers believe, is the most important of all the fields of philosophy, or all the branches. Keep that in mind. We need something, a way to argue that we can agree upon. Um, and the first I want to start with is this little section here. It's going to be about logical consistency and why we ought to be consistent with our statements. Um, for example, let's say you have a friend who makes this claim uh, that all killings are wrong. He's discussing, I don't know, maybe we're talking about uh, the death penalty or something like that. And uh, in, this, in this kind of conversation you're having, he then ends up making a statement a little later that some executions are just. And we kind of stop for a second and say, something's not right there. Now, assuming just means right, okay, and unjust means wrong, so we can match it up with right or wrong here, um, there seems to be something wrong here. Is that, well, execution is a type of killing. And if all killings are wrong, then you cannot make the case that at least some executions are just, because no matter what the type of killing is, each claim is wrong. Now, before we go jump down his throat, we might want to give it, uh, and this is like what a, a logician or any philosopher should do, is always give the person who's arguing or the person who's making the claim the benefit of the doubt. You know, ask them to clarify what they're talking about. You know, maybe they meant killing, they didn't really mean killings. Maybe they meant murder, which is different than killing, right? Um, there could self-defense is a type of killing, but we don't usually generally consider that murder. Some people think executions aren't necessarily murder, but they are a killing. So maybe he was like, oh, I mistook, and he goes, well, what I didn't meant to do or meant to say was all murder, okay, you just say, is wrong. And then in execution, he may say, I don't think that some executions are necessarily murder or justified, and that's why they're just. And now we'd have a consistent statement. That is what we want in philosophy. That is what logic wants. Now, what if he goes, nope, I meant all killing is wrong, and some executions are just, and they just didn't give. Well, if that's the problem, if that's what they're really saying, then they are being logically inconsistent, and that is what I want to draw our attention to. You know, someone would say, it's like, well, who cares about being consistent? You know, I don't care about that at all. Like, you know, why, what, who makes a big deal about it? Well, why do that? Well, to be consistent is because if you are not consistent, what you will fall into is something extremely important in logic and in philosophy in general, and that is the law of contradiction or of non-contradiction, or the idea of just what a contradiction is. And that is the idea of, if you're making a contradiction, you are affirming and denying the same statement. You are saying yes to something, and you're saying no to the exact same thing. For example, what he said, if we go back, if that said all killing is wrong, and some executions are just, what he is saying is, all killing is wrong, yet some killing is not wrong. Wait, what? It's either all killing is wrong, or some cannot be wrong. You cannot have it both. In fact, one thing we know about contradiction, this is an assumption of logic, but it's a very good assumption, because there hasn't been a statement that affirms and denies it has been the other way other than this, is that all statements that are a contradiction are always false. There we go, always false. It is impossible, according to logic, for a statement which affirms and denies the same thing to ever be true. It's never happened. It is always false. So to the person who goes, why be consistent? Who cares if my statements contradict each other? Well, if you are concerned with truth, then you definitely want to be worried about it. And as philosophers, we are concerned with truth. So that is something we are very, uh, um, is very important to us. Now, if there's a person who just doesn't care and keeps on going, well, generally in philosophy, though, in my opinion, I try my best to try to make them see the right way or see the light. But many philosophers just say that person is just, we can't really argue with them. That's, we just kind of got to put them over and say, well, we can't be arguing. We'll move on to people who are concerned with truth. It's kind of a debate of what we should do about those people, but we'll leave that for there for now. Um, now, take this idea of contradiction, and now let's, I want to bring us to another concept in logic that's very important. It's the idea of the difference between causal possibility and logical possibility. So let's talk about causal possibility. Causal possibility is anything that is possible according to the laws of nature. So if it could happen here on Earth, 
if it could happen maybe on the moon or wherever it might be, anything that the laws of nature say could happen, then we say is causally possible. So this is what physics and scientists talk about. Um, for example, I might ask, is it causally possible for me to jump one foot? Probably can't see down there, but I just, it was almost a foot. I can't jump, I'm, I'm kind of short. But um, it is, is possible, it is causally possible for me to jump one foot. But now I would ask this, is it causally possible for me without any assistance here on the planet Earth for me to jump 100 feet? I mean, I could try. It's not going to happen. That would be causally impossible according to the laws of physics that we know here on Earth. So we'd say that's causally impossible. In philosophy, though this can be important, we are not as concerned about that as much as we are about logical possibility. And I'll show you why in a second, but let's explain what logical possibility is. So logical possibility is anything that can happen according to the laws of logic. Or another way is anything that can happen that doesn't lead to a contradiction. Or a third way, anything that you can imagine is logically possible. If, it's if you cannot imagine it, if it leads to a contradiction, or in another way, it cannot be fought, then it would be logically impossible. All right, so you're like, wait a minute, what? That's crazy. So if it cannot be fought, can't anything be fought? Not necessarily. So let me give you an example. Let's take the one about me jumping again. So is it logically possible for me to jump one foot? And I, and I got a little help that time, right? Yes, it is, okay? Now ask me, is it logically possible for me to jump 100 feet here on Earth? A causally, no way. We've already determined that. But what logical possibility about is that can you think it? Can you imagine it? Can you conceive of that? So close your eyes and imagine me jumping right now and shooting up 100 feet. If you can imagine it, then it's logically possible. If it can be fought, so let's put that there. Can it be fought? There we go. I'm running out of room over here, in a new room doing this. So can it be fought? There's a question mark in there. Okay. If yes, it's logically possible. If no, it's logically impossible. Here's another example. Is it logically possible for me to fly faster than a speeding bullet? You might go, well, no. Well, but think about it. Could you imagine it? Could you conceive it? Could you think it? Close your eyes, and I promise you can. You can imagine yourself or me doing that. Um, one way that's really interesting, you know, um, uh, the uh, person writing our text, Raul, talks about thinking about it in a movie. Um, and if you could, you know, could you imagine it happen in a movie? then it's logically possible. Or I like to think, could you dream it? If you could dream it, then it's logically possible. And so, you know, you might be going, to, well, doesn't that, I could dream anything. I could imagine anything I want. That's not necessarily so. So let me give you an example. And I'm not gonna even show you what color this piece of chalk is in my hand. You, you might already know, you might have saw it earlier, but let me pretend to grab a different one. Okay, and so I'm not even showing you this, and I'm gonna say something about this chalk. This piece of chalk is all white and all blue at the exact same time. Now, you've never seen it, but just think about it. Can you think that? Now, if you're thinking correctly enough about this, you would realize that that is impossible. Now, why? It's because I, what I've said is I have given you a contradiction. Okay? I have said it is all one thing and all another. I didn't say it was like halfway between blue and white. I didn't say it's white in one second, blue in the next second. I said at the exact same time, this piece of chalk is all white and all blue. Now, close your eyes and just try to imagine this piece of chalk. Here it is now. It's white. Okay? Imagine that piece of chalk, the same piece in your mind's eye. Imagine it being all white and all blue at the exact same time. Not going back and forth, not two separate images. It's impossible to do that. You cannot see it as all white and all black. That's something which cannot be think, excuse me, cannot be thought. It can't be done in a movie. It can't be done in a dream. It is logically impossible. It is impossible to think that. There are many things that logically cannot be thought. And that is what we're more and more focused on in this. Like even though things like, you know, could I sprout wings and fly away right now? That's causally impossible, but totally logically impossible, because you can imagine it. But why are we so focused on things like a piece of chalk being all one color, all not? Well, it, what's important about this, and why you might think, like, that's ridiculous. I should focus on what science talks about. Who cares about these strange possibilities? But what's interesting about this is the relationship between causal possibility and logical possibility. If something is logically possible, okay? then it is also causally possible, okay? So if it's largely possible, it definitely could happen causal possibility, but we have to go and look at the causal possibility and see this case. Like I say, I could sprout wings and fly away right now. It's logically possible, but then when we go look over here, is it causally possible? We go, no, okay? Um, also, the relation goes the other way. If anything is causally possible, 
Okay? It definitely is logically possible, 100%. Anything that's happening in the real world is something that can logically be thought. But what's interesting is when we think about logical impossibility. If something is logically, well, maybe I'll, let me take a step back. Let's talk about causal impossibility. Something could be impossible in the real world, but possible in the logical world, such as the sprouting wings again. But if we look at logical impossibility, something that cannot be thought, if we then ask the question, can it happen in reality, in nature, we automatically know it cannot, all right? You can never see this chalk at all. And I will tell you it's all black or all blue, whatever, and all white at the exact same time. And you go, that cannot be true. We don't even have to ask the question of reality. We already know logically that's impossible anyway. And so why is that important for philosophy, and we'll see why this is where logic's gonna be based upon, is because if we understand what's logically impossible and possible, it will give us an objective way to be able to evaluate what can happen in reality. We'll be able to say for sure these things cannot happen. And why is that important? Because people will give arguments all the time that use terms that are causally possible, maybe. Okay? But when they put them together in a logical analysis, do not turn out to be anything that could happen here. And if you've ever noticed, you know, when, you know, if you, sh if you talk to somebody who's arguing something very controversial about God or about life or about the soul, whatever it might be, free will is another one we'll look at. As you'll see, no matter what they'll say, they'll use these terms, and people will all get up in, all, you know, in arms about, like, oh, well, you know, they said God, so I have to believe it. But if we can show what they're saying is logically impossible, that they said God is all this and all that at the same time, or free will can do this and that, yet it leads to a contradiction, we don't have to then go look at the universe and try to prove it. Off the bat, without knowing anything about the world, we can tell you that's a bad argument. And that is why having logical possibility and impossibility are really important for us. It will give us an objective standard to evaluate a good argument. All right, now let's talk about standard form. Uh, and this is how we put arguments so we can clearly see them. Uh, we're gonna have a very simple example here. Uh, but a lot of times when people give an argument, they're giving it, they're not giving you like, here's my first premise, here's my second premise, here's what I'm concluding. They don't do that. They actually give it in you know, a paragraph form where they're speaking it. And so a lot of times it makes it easy for us philosophers to see what's going on is to put it in this particular form that we've all gotten used to. Um, now an argument is always made up of two parts. You need at least one premise, okay, which is your evidence, all right, and then you need the conclusion, okay, which is what you're trying to prove. The evidence is supposed to support your conclusion. You have to have those two parts to have an argument. All you need is at least one premise and one conclusion. So as you'll see in this philosophy course and, and other, other uh, arguments, you'll see there's a lot more than one premise. And sometimes there's multiple conclusions, such as sub-conclusions and things we'll do. But let's give an example here. So let's say you had a friend who tells you this. Um, angels exist because one spoke to me last night. Okay, so let's just trust what they're saying, um, and we want to try to draw out what the conclusion is and what the premise is. Sometimes finding the conclusion is the easiest part. So what they're trying to conclude here is, as you'll see, is, take a look, angels exist, right? That is what they're trying to prove. They believe angels exist. Okay, now what is their evidence for this? Well, what their claim is, well, one spoke to me last night. So that would be their premise. So the conclusion is angels exist. The premise is one spoke to me last night. So in standard form, the way we'd write this is we put a one, and then we begin with our first piece of evidence, or our premise, which is an angel spoke to me, okay, last night. There we go. And then our conclusion will go next to this little triangle thing here, which means therefore angels exist. Okay, and what we do is, you know, depending on how many premises are, there'd be a two or a three or four, we keep going, and then once we finish our evidence, or our premises, we would draw the line, put our little triangle spot here, right, our therefore, and then we put our conclusion. Therefore, we can now look at what is actually being said, kind of pull apart and understand what, you know, what are they trying to say versus what they're trying to conclude, or what their evidence is versus what their conclusion is. Now, you might look at this, and some of us more cynical might say, well, this is not a very good argument. Uh, I don't believe in angels all the way, but let's just be what logic would tell us. Let's assume the premise is true. Would the conclusion be true? So if it was really true that an angel spoke to me last night, well, then I would conclude that angels exist. Now, what we're probably more worried about in here is something that would, would um, the difference between what we call validity and soundness, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but the idea is that if that's true, then this would be the case. If a real angel spoke to him, well, that means angels would exist, okay? Now, our question is, did that really happen? Were they dreaming? What was going on? 
Or do they have a daughter named Angel, maybe? And that's what they were talking about. What do they mean by angels? Talk about people named that? You know, there's a lot of things we need to get to, but just on the surface, if this was true, that would be the conclusion. We would have a logical argument here. The next step would be looking into the real world and to see if you know, this is really occurring. To go back to that little section we said earlier about the difference between logical possibility and causal possibility to help you out. And we'll see in just a little bit when we talk about validity and soundness, what we mean by it. Um, so for here, this is what we'll always have, and we're going to see a bunch more examples of the standard form in just a few minutes. Okay, now let's talk about one of the most important arguments in logic, deductive arguments. Um, also, I'll make a, a quick statement. Is In this section, we're not going to talk about inductive arguments, so they're also very important to uh, logic as well. Uh, if you check out my section on epistemology, David Hume, you'll see we talk plenty about inductive arguments there. But just for now, what's important is stick with deductive arguments. An inductive argument is any argument where the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises, or the conclusion is guaranteed from the premises, or the premises guaranteed the conclusion. Um, let me give you an example of what we're talking about here. So here, if John does drugs, then he is irresponsible, is our first premise. And in our second premise, we say, John does drugs. Well, even if we don't show you what that says right there, okay, what the conclusion is, if we assume one and two are true, what must be the conclusion of this? Well, it says, if John does drugs, he's irresponsible. That's true, guaranteed. Well, he does drugs. Well, the conclusion is necessary that, well, John is irresponsible then. It's almost like a math problem where it's like, this is what it said, this is what you get. This is what we're claiming. We, we don't take any other information other than what's in there. And assuming one and two are true, this would be the conclusion we must have. If we have an argument in which the premises guarantee the conclusion, or the conclusion necessarily, assuming they're true, necessarily falls from the premises, you have a deductive argument, one of the most important arguments in all philosophy. Now, some of you may be sitting there scratching your heads and going like, well, wait a minute, you know, just because John does drugs doesn't mean he's irresponsible. What type of drugs? Are we talking about Advil? Or some may think like marijuana really isn't a, uh, a, a drug that's as harmful, and if he does those, he's not necessarily irresponsible. Or if he's doing drugs in a responsible way, he might not be irresponsible. And you're right. But now you're talking about something outside of logic. We are now talking about soundness, which is actually going to, as we'll see, is the kind of realm of epistemology. We're going to talk about that section here in just, actually next, we'll talk about it. Um, but remember, you can't, don't assume anything outside of what you think about the real world. Just take what is said in the argument. What do these two premises say? Assuming they're true, is this what we would get? If yes, we have a deductive argument, okay? And now once we've clarified that, hey, that we know this person is making sense of what they're talking about, we can then move on to seeing if it's really true about the world. Let me show you something else that kind of connects with this. Is what if I were to say this? Let's erase those drugs and is irresponsible and we reverse it and say, John is irresponsible, okay? And it says, John does drugs. So we reverse what we've said here. Now think about it. The first premise says, if John does drugs, then he is irresponsible. Then we say, well, John is irresponsible. And then we try to conclude that John does drugs then. But as we see, the conclusion does not necessarily follow from these premises. All the first premise says is, if John does drugs, then he's irresponsible. It doesn't say anything about if he's irresponsible, that he'll do drugs. Okay? So think about this. You know, you can do drugs, okay, you're guaranteed to be irresponsible, but could you be irresponsible for something other than drugs? Uh, maybe you uh, drive with your eyes closed, or drive a better one, you drive while texting. Uh, that would be irresponsible too, it has nothing to do with drugs. So just because you're irresponsible, it does not mean you're doing drugs according to what's said in here. It can only be, and we'll see when we look at kind of the standard form arguments for deductive in just a little bit, we'll see why just because it says this, you cannot make this claim and then get this conclusion, all right? And we'll see, this is the x, the y, you're giving us a y and then trying to give us x here. That doesn't work, okay? And we'll show you why here in a bit. But, so that would actually not be a deductive argument. In fact, that would be a bad argument. And this kind of will show us um, what we're about to talk about in a second. If someone were to give us this argument, John does drugs and he is irresponsible, John is irresponsible and then says John does drugs, we don't even have to get into the question of what drugs are, what it means to be irresponsible, and if John does them at all, because I can show you right off the bat, that's not even an argument. That doesn't even make sense what you're saying. And so we're not going to speak to you until you give us a good argument. So deductive arguments, any argument where the conclusion must necessarily follow from the premises. And let's, just out of my OCD here, let's change this up and do, uh, get back to what we, what we wanted. An actual deductive argument, John does drugs 
and John is irresponsible. That does follow. No. And once again, it says, if John does drugs, then he's irresponsible, assuming that's true. Well, John does do drugs. Okay, what's the Y back there? Well, therefore, excuse me, the X. And therefore, John is irresponsible, you get Y. If X, then Y. You have X, therefore you get Y. All right? And now I will mention one more thing before we go to our next section. I mentioned inductive arguments. I'll just write the name up there. Inductive. That is any argument where the conclusion probably follows from the premises. And it's, it's kind of a different style of argument. But as I said, check out my section on epistemology and David Hume uh, and the British empiricist. And we go all into inductive, uh, inductive arguments and what they are and how they work. All right, and now we're going to talk about deductive validity and soundness. We've been alluding to in all the sections so far, and really trying to get at one of our main ideas uh, to get out of this logic section. Um, and so what is deductive validity? So basically what we're doing is if the premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true. So what, what you want to do to find out if an argument is valid or not is to ask yourself, well, if the premises were true, would this conclusion follow from it? And if we were to assume yes about the premises, and that conclusion would follow, we would then say it's valid. So I have this little example here that I ran kind of out of the room. I know it looks like a three-year-old was writing it. My fault. My left-handedness here. Um, let's take this example here. So let's say this is our argument. If Angus has a car, then he has an SUV. And then our second premise is Angus has a car, and then we must conclude, well, Angus has an SUV. Now, if we just look at what the premises say and assume they're true, so don't think of anything about what is reality is really like. Don't think about what cars and SUVs are in the real world. Just honestly, the best way to do this is not even worry about what a car or SUV is. Just assume that's X, that's Y, and here's X, and Y again. Is Angus has this thing, and we're assuming that if you have this thing, then you have this other thing. If you got X, then you have Y. That is guaranteed because we are just for now assuming it's true. And then the second premise, assume that's true, that Angus really does have this car, has X. Well, according to what 1 and 2 says, this is the conclusion we must get, right? That Angus has an SUV. And if that is the case, if assuming it's true, these are true, and this is the conclusion we would get after assuming it's true, then we would have a valid argument. And we put a little circle with a V next to it. We know we have a valid argument here. Now, some of us will be going, wait a minute, but cars aren't SUVs. You know, we define them differently. Well, now we're talking about something different. And that's where we get to the idea of soundness. Validity, sorry, validity strictly has to do with the logic of the argument. Is if we assume these things are true, would it really be the case? Okay, if we look at the metaphor like in mathematics, if you take two and two, assuming you have those things, would they equal four? We would say yes. But that leaves open the question, do you really have two things and two things to bring together right now? Is that really true about the world? That's a separate question. And that one has to do with soundness. Are the premises actually true about the world? Is this is what, when we say these things, are they really happening? You know, does Angus really have a car? And are all cars really SUVs? These are the things we'd ask. Now, assuming those are true, okay, then we would get this sound. But let's just assume, you know, for the sake right now, that all cars aren't SUVs. So if Angus has a car, then he wouldn't have an SUV. Even if he has a car, he wouldn't get an SUV. And so in this argument, we would say is unsound. Okay, if we were to change it, that maybe it says, if Angus has a car, then he has uh, a steering wheel. Angus has a car, therefore Angus has a steering wheel. That would be a sound, because that's true about cars in the world. And we'd write S in front of that, right? So we have a valid argument that's also sound. The perfect arguments are ones that do this, that are not only valid, but are also sound as well, okay? Um, some other things I want to show you, and then we're going to go back to this valid and sound thing. Um, one way to ask yourself, if you're not sure about validity, is to ignore what they say, and instead of using X and Y's, I use things like uh, apples and fruit, okay, or apples, oranges, and fruit, whatever you need. So if I were to change this and go, if Angus has an apple, then he has a fruit. Angus has an apple, therefore Angus has a fruit. You would get that because all apples are fruit, right? But if I were to change it and say this, um, if Angus has an apple, then he has a fruit, and I were to say Angus has a fruit, therefore Angus has an apple, that would be invalid. We would know that's wrong because think about it. Just because you have a fruit doesn't mean you have an apple. You might have an orange or a kumquat or a tomato. Forget tomato, it's fruit. Okay? And so if we were to write that up there, we would see that that logically, the conclusion that he has an apple would not follow from the premises. And therefore, we would have an invalid argument. And the thing that's important about invalid arguments, and this is why I want to show us how to distinction between validity and soundness. 
If we can show you an argument is invalid, then there's a connection between uh, validity and soundness. If it's invalid, it can never be sound. It can never be true about the world. So if we can show you from the back, before we get into arguments about cars, SUVs, what fruit are, and all those things like that, if I can show you that an argument is invalid and the conclusion would not follow from what your premise is saying, then I can throw your argument out right off the bat. I don't have to get into that messy stuff about what an SUV and a car are. We can just say, well, that doesn't matter because the argument you're giving me doesn't make any sense. In fact, it's about as good as saying blah, 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 blah. All right? It doesn't matter. Now, if you give me a valid argument, then the next step is to ask about this question. Okay? So think about this. If you have a valid argument, it can be sound. Okay? Uh, but an invalid argument can never be sound or unsound. You don't even need to ask that question. But you could have a valid argument that's either sound or a valid argument that's unsound as well. And that's where a really important questions come. And when we start getting to soundness, this concept here, now we're starting to get things that are outside of strictly deductive logic. Now we're getting to things that have to do about you know, perception and our opinion about the world. You know, who is decide what really a car, SUV, or fruit is? How do we decide that? You know, th those terms might be easy, but what happens when we're talking about things like God or free will? Those questions about our opinions and about how we perceive the world, that's when we get a little messy. And that gets into the section on epistemology, when we have to talk about what can we know and cannot know. And that's much more messy. But at least in logic, we can show you what is not a good argument. And then right off the bat, throw all those bad arguments out. And then we can prepare the good arguments for our epistemic pursuits. And then we can look at epistemology of how maybe we can determine whether these arguments are sound or unsound. And then if we can get the prize, right, the valid and sound argument, then we have a good argument, a true argument. And that is, of course, what philosophers always want. That's where we get the truth from. Okay, and now let's kind of get to our last section of uh, this logic lecture, um, and that is deductive forms. We were just talking about validity and soundness, and um, you know I put the importance in logic on validity, and that soundness is more of a question for epistemology. But there are some arguments that we will see so often in philosophy that we that are all that are just so commonly used that we just try to, as philosophers to memorize that they're always valid, and then we can move directly on to seeing if they're sound. Now, there are way more than four of these, okay? Uh, but these are the four that are most commonly used in my class and you, you'll generally see in life, though there are other ones as well. And so what I'm just trying to get here is that whenever you see an argument in this form, no matter, no matter what the words are, no matter what the statement they are saying, no matter what they put in and instantiate for X or Y, that if it is in this logical form, if it follows this pattern, then it is always valid and you can move to the next question of whether it's sound or not. Um, it doesn't matter what they're saying. And I'll try to show that point as we're going. So the most common one you generally will find will be modus ponens, which looks in this form that if x, then y. Second premise is you have x, therefore you get y. Think about what it says, assuming they're true. And if, if you have an x, then you got y. Well, I have an x. Well, according to what the first premise says, then, well, y must be the conclusion. And you can use p's and q's, whatever variables you want, as long as they're lowercase. Um, for this, I like using x's and y's and z's. Um, and so let's put let's instantiate. Let's go back to that John is irresponsible. That was a modus ponens. Um, if John does drugs, then he's irresponsible. John does drugs, that's what X says, therefore he's irresponsible. Now remember, the modus ponens always has to be in this form. If you were to flip-flop it, for example, if you were to put Y there and then try to say X, okay, that wouldn't work if we go back to that thing about John being irresponsible, right? That if John does drugs, then he's irresponsible. John's irresponsible, therefore he does drugs. Remember, he could be irresponsible for something else other than drugs, like texting while driving. Um, there's, you know, also if you want to use my examples about apples and fruits and oranges, if you have an apple, then you have a fruit, and you try to say, I have a fruit, it doesn't mean you have an apple. There's all types of other fruits you could have. So we see that wouldn't be a valid argument. Only if it's in this logical form that we have here first, okay, is it valid, and is it as a modus ponens? So we'll go back to the fruit. If I have an apple, and I have a fruit. I have an apple, therefore I should have a fruit. So what you want to do is just when you see any argument in that form, you want to memorize it. As that is already valid, let's move on. You will see that a lot this semester or during any of my videos when we give arguments. That a lot of philosophers give arguments in that form. Then we have like the brother or sister or maybe cousin argument uh, or a valid argument to modus ponens. That is modus tollens, and where we're going to add a negation into this. And if we see, you know, they both start out the exact same way. So. You might get, you're going to get an assignment here a little bit if you're in my class where you have to tell the difference. Tone, uh, pones and tolens are 
easy to spot off, you know, hey, I know the difference between these other ones, but sometimes they're hard to tell the difference. And the way to tell the difference between the two is modus tollens, or sorry, modus tollens gives a negation. So it starts the same way. If you have x, then you get y, but this little tilde, okay, what you put for it means a negation, but not y. So if you have an x and you have y, but you do not have any y's, so that guarantees that you do not have any x's, but you get not x. So let's take, for example, um, if you're determined, uh, then you're not free. So not free is going to be y, okay? And then we have not y, so not being free was y, so a negation of not, of not free would be being free, okay? Therefore, you're not determined, all right? Now, if we flip-flop that, um, let's, use, let's use the fruit one again. That, that really is clear, I think, for a lot of people. If you have an apple, then you have a fruit, but you don't have any fruits. So what would that mean? If, you're, if you don't have any fruits at all, you definitely, according to this, would not have an apple. And therefore, that would be a valid argument. And now we can look if fruits and apples are the same, or if you'll go back to free will and determinism, if those things are really connected that way. If you want to take a look at my lecture on free will and determinism, you can find out a lot about that. Um, but just like before, you can't flip-flop this. You can't have a not x and a not y, okay? So let's use those apples and fruits. That um, If you have an apple, then you have a fruit. You don't have an apple, therefore you don't have a fruit. That isn't the case. Once again, you could have something like a tomato or a kumquat or a kiwi, whatever it might be, an orange, okay? So remember, they have to be in that form to be uh, the case. And it doesn't matter what x or y is, okay? Um, they can be anything. I mean, we could say, if blah blah, then blah blue. You don't have blah blue, well then you don't have blah blah. That is still a valid argument. The, it's the question of soundness to determine whether blah blah and blah blue mean anything about the world and if they're true. And like I said, that's more of an epistemic problem, which we will look at in epistemology. Okay? First thing we want to determine is, is what they're saying, does it make sense? Okay? And once we have that it made sense and it's valid, then we can move on to it. You'd be surprised at how many people give just arguments that don't make sense that are invalid, yet we go on and argue about the soundness before we just can show that what they're saying doesn't make sense. Just turn on the TV tonight, on the news. You'll find people doing this, okay? So, other side here, let's draw a little line here. We have two other arguments that we'll come across a lot in my philosophy course uh, and in life. This one is a disjunctive syllogism, which is different from the rest because it's not an if-then or a conditional statement in the normal sense. Um, we see either x or y and not both. So I don't always write this. Now, if you get into more advanced logic classes, that is going to be a key term because there's different types of disjunctive syllogisms. And sometimes you mean either x or y or maybe both. Okay? But for our class and for now, just assume that when we say x or y, we mean it as a true disjunct, that it's either this or it's that. It cannot be both. Okay? I wrote it up there just to be clear. If you take later logic classes, that will make sense. But for now, let's just assume that it's always going to be the case, even if we don't write it. Okay? take that out for now. And so, assuming they're not both, say so x or y, and then you get, well, not y, I don't have y. Well, if it's either x or y, you don't have y. Well, the conclusion must be x. You have to have x. It's either one or the other. Now, what's interesting, so let's sort of make you an example first. So, you could say, like, either um, I'll go to the concert tonight or I'll stay home. I didn't stay home, therefore, I went to the concert tonight, assuming that I couldn't do something else or couldn't do both, right? Okay, and you get that. But also, you could flip-flop that. This is the only one. The other three you can't do, but on this one, if you want, you could say X happened, and then what would you get? Well, the conclusion with that would be not Y. So either I, let's see, ate a fruit or I ate a vegetable. Well, I ate a fruit, and according to the first premise, that means I can't eat vegetables, so I didn't eat a vegetable. But you could also do another one here. So let's go, let's say I did Y this time. So I either ate a fruit or a vegetable, I had a vegetable, so I didn't eat a fruit, okay? And then the final one would be, what is it here? Uh, it would be not x, so I didn't eat a fruit, therefore I ate a vegetable. See, on a disjunctive syllogism where it cannot be both, you can flip-flop these, all right? And they would still all be valid. So disjunctive syllogisms are easy to spot because you're going to see an either or. But determining which way is the premise, second premise, and what's the conclusion, you're going to need to look at context clues such as what is the reader has given you, such, or the speaker has given you, such as, um, you know, thus, or because, these terms that you kind of will, will show you the uh, premise from the conclusion, and you're reading, you probably read a little bit about that to kind of help you, and if they don't give you any context clues, then for my class at least, you can try to assume what they probably meant, and as long as you have the correct, you know, a negation here, and with a variable, and a different variable without a negation, or flip-flopped, okay, you see the pattern here, all right, 
have a negation here, you gotta, can't have one here, okay? As long as you do that and give me a valid argument, you'll be okay, okay? And of course, once we determine it's valid, well then we gotta move on to soundness and that's a much different thing. Was it really either or? Could you have had both? Was there a third option? And so forth. Okay, and then the last one we need for our class is hypothetical syllogism. And this one starts off looking like modus ponens and modus tollens, and then it gives us a third variable, which is the, that's how you can tell it apart from all the other ones. This has three variables in it. Or you wanna look three if-then statements. Okay, so it starts out with if x, then you get y. And then you claim, well, if you have y, then you have a z. And what happens is the y here connects the x to the z, and then you can make this statement. Well, then if you have x, then you're guaranteed to get z. All right, now one thing I want to point out is if you're writing a hypothetical syllogism, it should always end in an if-then statement. You should never have just x or z or y at the end of it. If you do, then something went wrong, okay? So uh, think of it this way. Um, if I go to school, then I will become educated. If I become educated, then I'll be successful in life. Therefore, if I go to school, I will be successful in life. That would be a logical, valid argument, and any time we see it in that order, it is valid. And we can then move on to say, well, does school really um, make you educated, and if you're educated, are you really successful? There could be things we could argue about with that, um, but that, again, is an epistemic problem, one of soundness. But if you give that argument, we automatically know, well, we can, your argument's correct, now let's look at the world and see if it happens, and that's a lot more messy. Um, but just like before, you cannot flip-flop these. You can't put you know, Z here and X here, or Y here and vice versa. They always have to be in this order. Always have to be this, X to Y, Y to Z, and X to Z. If you were to find a hypo hypothetical syllogism in another order, okay, you know right away it's invalid, and you should be able to point that out. Now, with all this being said here, okay, uh, if you were in my class, if you're just watching this video for the heck of it, hopefully that's enough. There are some things that you might want to check out um, that we didn't cover, but this should cover most of what we are in my class. You'll have an assignment. Uh, a little like quiz that you'll probably have to do. Um, if I'm still giving it, I know I'm giving it right now. Uh, who knows, 10 years from now, if I'm still using this video, what I might be doing then. But you should have an assignment that's gonna question you on these things and try to get you to point out um, valid arguments from invalid arguments and sound ones from unsound ones. Also, it's gonna get you to try to show, can, you sh can I give you an argument? And can you then tell me whether it's modus ponens or disjunctive syllogism or hypothetical syllogism, on and on, and then could you write it out in the correct form so it's valid. I'm gonna say, hey, make this a valid argument in hypothetical syllogism. And then you have to be able to write it out the right way. You'll see there's a, some, an assignment I'm gonna give on that. Um, and if you need some extra help after you do it, I'll have um, a uh, little document that hopefully is gonna go over all that and will help you with any extra questions you have. But as usual, if you have any questions on any of this stuff, anything that, um, that has come up that you might wanna talk about, please send me an email. It's scastleberry at jtcc.edu. Um, I'm available for any students and anyone who's interested in philosophy, as long as it's a philosophy question, um, I'll be there for you. Um, and other than that, um, you guys have a good day, and I will talk to you soon.